If you turn into Acts chapter 4, we will look together at the words that Peter spoke when he was before the council in Jerusalem. And what we're doing here is uh, we're letting Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, tell us what the fundamentals of the faith are. What are the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ? And then we're going together to look at the sermons in the book of Acts. Today, just, just this one in Acts 4. But try to see there the fundamentals that were mentioned in Hebrews to understand how this works and how they did it. And it's the same call today. We are being, all of us being called to obey God. So it's Acts 4, it's verses 8 through 12 that we're contemplating at the moment. And, you know, Peter and John had just performed a miracle. God had allowed a miracle to be performed through them, healing a man who had been uh, born with the inability to walk. And uh, he received his strength and immediately went into the temple to worship. And this led to them teaching the people and this is annoying to the council who don't want Jesus to be taught and don't want uh, anything to interfere with their stranglehold on the people and they asked him well you know by what name did you do this and it begins there at the eighth verse Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said this Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that's the entirety of the, of the word from Peter that we're looking at today. But as we think about the things that Hebrews 6 talks about, one of the things that it speaks of is repentance from dead works. Do we see that here in what Peter said to them in, in Acts 4? Well, we do. For example, he said to them in the 10th verse, Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that this one, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified. God raised him from the dead. This is the means by which it's been done. How is this repentance? Well, the people, and the rulers especially, had condemned him, caused him to be crucified. And they're asking specifically, what is the authority by which you do this? And he told them the authority, the name in which they do this, is that of Jesus let it be known to all of you. That's a change of mind, a change of heart. They are aware that they crucified Jesus, but they don't understand yet that God raised him from the dead and that he is the means by which this notable miracle is accomplished. So they are in need of that repentance, that change of thinking, that change of mind. The other thing he says in the 11th verse this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. 
Well, this is a reference to a passage in the Old Testament, but this is enough to make it clear. They think of themselves as the builders who are in the business of selecting the stones to, to make things out of, but he is the stone that has become the chief cornerstone, although it was rejected. This is also a call to repentance, that they have got to turn from this idea that, that Jesus is to be rejected, that he's to be crucified. They have to come to know that he is the real Lord, that he is the real cornerstone. And that 12th verse said, there is salvation in no one else. This is also repentance from dead works because at the moment their trust is in someone else, not the Lord Jesus. But there is not another in whom we can place our trust and expect salvation. This also is repentance from dead works. They have to change that allegiance. The other thing that Hebrews 6 talks about is faith towards God, which also we see, for example, in Acts 4 at verse 9, he said, are we being examined about a good deed done to a crippled man by what means this man has been healed? That's a miracle is what that is. That is a miracle. God is doing this miracle. I remember being in uh, classical civilization, the, uh, a college course I had um, in Roman civilization, and the professor had a chapter on magic where he talked about their different magicians and their soothsayers and all those kinds of things, but he went ahead and put uh, the miracles of the New Testament in with it, which was fun. Uh, and he did, at some point before closing the chapter, he said that the thing about the New Testament is that it has, it seems to have a fascination with congenital illnesses and deformities. At which point, of course, I raised my hand and he called on me and I said, that's because those can't be faked, sir. <laughs> but it's true. How was this man healed? Everybody knew who he was. Everybody knew how long he had been crippled and not able to go into the temple because of his deformity, because that's the law. But now he's healed, and now he goes in rejoicing, and everybody knows who he is. How did this happen? It has to be God. Put your faith in God. That's the idea. And the 10th verse, the name of Jesus. It's God who raised Jesus. Though Jesus is the authority here, because God made him the authority, God raised him from the dead. And we ought to believe that God has the power to raise the dead. He has the power to forgive us our sins. He has the power to turn our lives around if we will give them to him in simple trusting faith. But this is faith towards God. He can heal this man. He can raise Jesus from the dead. He can certainly forgive us of our sins. The other thing that Hebrews 6 talks about is instruction about washings, which is baptisms. If you didn't realize it, the word there in Hebrews 6 for washings is actually baptisms. They just don't like to translate that because it admits that baptism is one of the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, and they tell people they don't have to do it. That's inconvenient. But Acts 4, 12, he said to them, there is no other name by which we must be saved. And now somebody will say, that doesn't have anything to do with baptism. Well, it doesn't directly say baptism on the one hand. On the other hand, this same Peter, just two chapters back in chapter 2, at verse 38, said to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. There is Acts 4.12, no other name by which we must be saved. He also said in Acts 2 at verse 40, save yourselves or be saved from this crooked generation. When you put Acts 2.38 and Acts 2.40 together and you put them with Acts 4.12, you can see that the name by which we are saved is the name of Jesus Christ. And that salvation is forgiveness of sins. And that is gotten by repent 
and be baptized, every single one of you. Acts 2.38. So, yep, that's instruction about washings. If they were willing to receive it, that's where this would have gone. But you notice a glaring absence here. In Acts 2, the crowd said, Brothers, what should we do? That's not what the council is doing. They're not listening to this. They're not repentant. And in Acts 4.11, I'd like to point out what Hebrews calls laying on of hands. Uh, when Hebrews 6 talks about the laying on of hands, it's not talking about the giving of the Holy Spirit. It's talking about what do you touch and what don't you touch. What is clean, what is unclean, what is holy, what is unholy. This is fellowship. We talk about fellowship. What do we have fellowship with? That's the meaning of laying on of hands. And yes, it is an elementary principle. They always say, oh, fellowship is too controversial. People never agree, but it's an elementary principle of the doctrine of Christ, according to Hebrews 6. This Jesus, he said in the 11th verse, is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. Yes, you see, their fellowship is themselves and their religion and their old ways. What will they lay hands to? What will they accept? And what will they not accept? What will they reject? Unfortunately, they have rejected Jesus, and they ought to lay hold of him. They ought to embrace him. That's the meaning of this teaching. So that's also a laying on of hands. Hebrews 6 speaks of the resurrection from the dead, which is explicitly named in the 10th verse. God raised Jesus from the dead. And finally, Hebrews 6 speaks of the eternal judgment, which Acts 4.12 addresses quite well when it says there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Under heaven, meaning in, you know, reality, in our reality, in the physical world, among men as opposed to among angels, among the Lord God, the throne room of the Most High, so it's everything, meaning this world is going to be judged. That has to come from outside of this world. That has to be eternal. And as he says here, we must be saved by this name. That's the criticality of it. The judgment of it is there is not another escape from anywhere under heaven. It applies to all of humanity, all of the earth. There is no other escape. It has to be this way. That is the eternal judgment. And so what you're finding is that, yes, when Hebrews describes the fundamentals of Christ, and we look at what the apostles said, at their opportunities to speak as they're recorded, and I hope to look at other ones with you. They always did this. They always talked about these things. And there's some variation here and there about how deep you go into one or the other, and that's an interesting thing. But they're always talking about the same thing. And it's true. So any of us who are teaching ought to have these in the pocket, you know, know that these are the fundamentals of the faith. This is what it is to teach the lost, to teach the doctrine of Christ. And these things ought to be, you know, our, our teaching ought to be tested against these things to make sure that we're covering these, addressing these in some way, even if it's indirect, but addressing it. But I will leave that with you for your consideration. That's Peter before the council. They were not too happy with him before or after he said these things. But he said them, and they are true, and they resonate with the other things that are recorded in the Acts, and they clearly do fulfill the requirements of Hebrews 6, verses 1 and 2, the fundamentals of the faith of Jesus. Appreciate your kind attention, but we today 
take advantage of the opportunity to obey the gospel. We have water here that you may be baptized, just as we have talked about and read from the book of the Acts. If as a Christian you have not lived right, repent and make things right with him, and let us pray on your behalf that you can be restored to him. But their plea is unchanged. The reason for referring back to Hebrews 6 and for, uh, as we plan to do, looking at how this is being used in other lessons throughout the Acts is not to be uh, pedantic and it's not to be attacking the five-step plan of salvation. The point of it is to show this is intact. This is unchanged. What God said and what they taught was always the same. And it has been with us from Acts chapter 2, completely intact. What we're calling, you know, on our friends and neighbors to do today, what God calls on all of us to do today is exactly what they were called on to do on that Pentecost recorded in Acts 2. It's not changed. It's not different. These are the fundamental principles of being right with God. Change your heart today. Put Jesus on in baptism today. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.